Racial and ethnic minorities are disproportionately at risk of being uninsured, lacking access to care, and experiencing worse health outcomes from preventable and treatable conditions. Underrepresented populations, tonight on call with the Prairie Doc, health information based on science, built on trust. Hello, I'm Dr. Deborah Johnston, tonight's Prairie Doc. This season, we continue to bring our viewers trusted health information from doctors and professionals within your own communities. Thank you for joining us again. Tonight, we are discussing healthcare in underrepresented populations. Joining us in the studio in Brookings are, are J.R. LaPlante, Director of Tribal Relations from Avera Health, Dr. Sophie Tuhawk from Avera Medical Group Internal Medicine, and Arna Moyer, Dr. Arna Moyer, a family medicine resident. And we'll be joined later by Dr. Carol Whitman, who is a psychiatry resident. Welcome, I'm so glad to have you guys with us tonight. We've got so much to talk about and such an important topic to discuss. Mr. LaPlante, tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be involved in healthcare. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this important topic. Um, well, I'm, I was born and raised on the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation, Eagle Butte, South Dakota is my hometown. Born and raised, I like to say I'm a natural born citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux <laughs> Tribe because I was actually born on the reservation when we actually delivered babies um, as, a, as a service at our Indian Health Service Hospital. Um, spent some time in, in tribal government but eventually found my way to law school and uh, actually had my own law practice for a, a few years. Um, but found my way uh, to Avera Health and was very taken in by Avera's mission to heal individuals and their communities, which I think is such a beautiful mission, um, but also comports with my own personal mission, which is to impact the, the lives of Indian people and communities through law. And I just kind of merged their mission with mine, and here I am. And we're glad to have you. Thank you. It's a wonderful addition to the organization and an important mission. Thank you. So, Dr. Tuhawk, tell us a little bit about you and your background. So I was born in South Dakota and moved all over the state when I was growing up. And my mother was actually a medical technologist. And there were some years where we would live in different states or different cities, but we would go back to Eagle Butte um, where were from as well, and she would work at the hospital. So one of the times I was at the hospital with my mother because she had to go in to see a patient to draw some blood, some of the doctors would take me on their rounds. And I became very interested in medicine that way and decided that this was what I wanted to do with my life. So I was able to go on and go through college. I went to the University of South Dakota, and then I was accepted into the University of South Dakota School of Medicine. I became my MD in 1987, and when I was going through medical schools trying to decide what I really liked to do, and finally decided to go into internal medicine. I did my internal medicine residency in Sioux Falls, and then I really liked critical care medicine as well, so I went and did a fellowship at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And then after that, I returned back to South Dakota and began my career with Indian Health Service. I worked almost 30 years for Indian Health Service, part of the time as a civil certain and also part of the time as a commissioned officer in the public health service. Uh, during that time we moved kind of all over the country, um, got to go see different Indian Health Service facilities through the country, got to experience a lot of different types of health care in different areas, uh, finished my career with Indian Health Service and then uh, finished my public health service career working as the uh, medical director for the TRICARE overseas program, so I actually got to see what health care was like in 205 different countries throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when I retired, I wasn't quite ready to fully retire, um, came back to Sioux Falls and started working for Avera for the internal medicine group. So that's where I am now. Um, that is a unique view of retirement. It is. <laughs> yeah, a very unique view of retirement. <laughs> so, and Dr. Mora, tell us about you and your background. Sure. Um, so first, uh, I was born in Maryland uh, during my mom here's uh, fellowship, so that's a fun <laughs> fact. 
um, and so also got to move around quite a bit. Didn't take quite as a, a direct a, approach to you know, what got me interested in the medicine. Um, took a little while, have a family of my own. Um, but looking back, all I can think is that I'm very thankful for the experiences that I had. Um, you know, my experience in medical school was great up at the University of North Dakota. Um, and then being a part of the residency here in Sioux Falls, um, I'm very grateful to be surrounded by so many individuals that really um, look towards trying to understand whole individuals and meeting the needs of those that are underserved. And it's been really, it's been really great. Um, I'm really proud of, you know, my mom, my sister, and um, you know, the people that I get to work with right now. So it's, uh, it's exciting. Um, I love the variety. I um, enjoy hospital medicine also, but OB and peds and it's great. The whole person. Mm -hmm. yep. Excellent. So we're going to have a great conversation tonight, everybody. So, and before we start that conversation, we invite you, our audience, to submit your questions about health care in underrepresented populations, especially the Native American population. We look forward to answering your questions. Viewers can contact us three ways. Call 1-888-376-625. Send an email to ask at prairiedoc.org or ask on our Prairie Doc Facebook page. We will work to answer as many of your questions as possible given the time available. Sometimes we receive more questions than we can cover and we apologize if we don't get to your question. To encourage you to ask early, all questions asked in the first 20 minutes will be entered into a drawing for one of our Prairie Doc gift items. The winner will be announced at the end of the program. Your question will remain anonymous, but please provide contact information when you submit your question so we can send you your gift. So one thing that I'd like to talk about is um, what barriers in general people, whether they are um, a member of an underrepresented population or not, might face in accessing health care. Dr. Arna. Uh, can you be a little more specific on? Well, anybody, you know, we, mm -hmm. we think about health care and we think about calling up and going to the doctor, um, but that's eas mm -hmm. an easier job mm -hmm. for some people or an yeah. easier decision and easier possibility for some people than it is for others. Yeah. So what kinds of barriers might anybody face? Yeah. Um, so as a part of our residency program, we actually spend um, a fair amount of time down at Falls Community Health, where we work directly with a lot of patients who have many barriers, including financial, um, cultural, um, a lot of the refugee population. Um, so there's definitely a lot of things that can step in between you and getting um, even acute needs taken care of, um, whether that's you're not comfortable or don't know how to get transportation to even see the doctor, um, you aren't sure you know, when you should go to the emergency room, you know, you, do you have money for medications, the visit, you know, how are you gonna make your appointment? There, there are a lot of things that um, sometimes get overlooked um, you know, if you don't have to face that, so. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't recognize how many things they have in their life that make things easier for them. You know, internet mm -hmm. access mm -hmm. so that I can log on and check my portal or, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't have a phone, how do you do that? So, um, Dr. Tuhawk, what barriers might be more specific to a Native American population? So if you look at our Native American populations, most of them live on reservations, which are very rural and isolated in the state of South Dakota. A lot of the transportation issues became a huge barrier for people because a lot of them don't have working cars, gas money for cars, the ability to get to the hospital or the clinic. So sometimes you're traveling 100 miles to get to the clinic. Um, even if you had a medical emergency, I mean, sometimes the ambulances could take hours to get there and back. So transportation is a huge issue for many of our native populations. Um, of course, then the other part of it is sometimes just um, knowing when is a good time to come. Um, some of it's a cultural issue as well. 
Um, you know, culturally, um, we look at healthcare just a little bit differently. We look at a lot of things a little bit differently. So, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, we're not a population who typically watch the clock, so to speak. So, you know, we always didn't look at things um, in the future. So, you know, it's kind of like, what's our immediate need? What is our immediate issue? And how do we face that first? Um, so, you know, if it's a choice between, you know, making sure you get the groceries today versus, you know, I'll, you know, maybe I have something going wrong and I'll take care of that later because it's not bothering me too bad today. So, you know, you take care of your immediate needs and then you don't always get to the preventative health kind of needs or the chronic care needs. Um, sometimes it's an issue of, um, more immediate family kind of issues going on, or maybe you don't even have a place to live or a place to be able to to get the care that you need. And, and you know, because a lot of times, if people are in the hospital and need to go home, you know, they need certain services for follow up. You know, you don't have a permanent residence. You know, how are people going to find you? How are they going to get to you? So there's some of those types of barriers that people face as well. Mr. Laplante, we were talking a little bit before the uh, show air before the show started about some of the differences in how health care is paid for for Native American individuals and uh, you told us things that I didn't know um, and I figure if I didn't know the odds are pretty darn good that a lot of our viewers didn't know some of the nuances and some of the complexity of paying for health care for the Native American population. Can you tell us a little bit about some of that? Yeah, <clears throat> very good question. I think it's related to the previous question about access to care. And I think if you look at the typical Native American patient uh, on the reservation, they present to the local Indian Health Service Hospital. What a lot of people don't realize is that the services that are available to a Native American resident of the reservation are just the services the program services function activities that are available within the four walls of that hospital or clinic. If there's a specialty need or if there's an emergency need or an urgent care need or a tertiary level need that patient has and it cannot be met at that within the four walls of that facility, that patient then needs to be referred outside the reservation to a private healthcare system like Avera Health. And that process is very daunting, uh, first of all, there's the transportation of that patient. Oftentimes that patient is transported by airplane or by ambulance to a, to a city far removed from the reservation and from their home community. Oftentimes their family can't come with them and they come to this, to a foreign place to receive or a foreign hospital to receive medication. Once they're there to receive that care, then they're, they pro, they're, they're provided this care. And a lot of people assume that because they're a Native American, because they have IHS, that the benefit or the coverage of IHS follows that patient to the third party provider. But what a lot of people don't realize is that IHS is not insurance. It's not, it's not portable. IHS services are connected to the facility. They're facility based. The way IHS pays for that care that that patient receives outside the IHS health system is purchased by a program in IHS called the Purchase Referred Care Program. But it's a finite source of funding. Uh, first of all, the patient has to be eligible for Purchase Referred Care. Secondly, the service that they receive has to be covered and approved by IHS. And then thirdly, that's assuming that there's any money left in the Purchase Referred Care Program at the local IHS hospital. And then fourthly, we don't, we're not even able to use those Purchase Referred Care dollars to carry that or to cover that cost until all the other payer sources are exhausted first because IHS is what they call what the federal regulations refers to as a payer of last resort. So when a Native American patient presents at Avera Health, they have already come from the reservation either by air or by ambulance. They've traveled many, many miles. They come into our facility. We find them a bed where they're provided services and then we figure out how to pay for the services at the end of the service, and sometimes we can pay for it. I just can pay for it. Sometimes I just can't pay for it. And th the reason for this, Deb, is because the Native American patient isn't like a normal, everyday patient. They may be racially Native American to us at Avera, but for healthcare purposes, they're politically affiliated to a federally recognized tribe with treaty rights to healthcare. 
And so their payer, pay, the payment mechanism is different for Native Americans. So we have to keep that in mind when we, when we have Native American patients who present to us. So it's a whole other layer of complexity. A whole layer, another layer of complexity, yes. So, so educating Avera is so important, of educating all of our non-IHS facilities about this payer, this payment mechanism is very vital. You, you said something a little earlier about how um, each individual has their own um, IHS home, basically, mm -hmm. and they are able to access the services that are provided by their own IHS mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. uh, and that means that they can't go to somebody else's IHS home. So if I am... They can. They can. They can. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, in, any Native American can access any service at any IHS facility okay. within that four walls. But when, when you, what do you mean by within that four walls? Within, that, within the four walls of that federal facility. Any Native American can access any service within the four walls of any IHS facility. I can go okay. to Yankton or I can go okay. to, to Fort Yates, even though I'm not a member of that tribe or a resident of, of that reservation. However, in order for me to be eligible for the Purchase Referred Care Program, which is the federal funding that pays for non-IHS purchased services, tertiary okay. care, specialty care. Um, um, I have to A, be a resident of that reservation. I have to use that facility as my primary care provider. I probably have to be a member of that tribe, not necessarily though, but certainly a resident of that reservation. There's probably about eight to nine criteria for eligibility. And, and again, once you determine eligibility, that's just the beginning because then what has to happen, we have to determine if the service that was provided is a covered service of PRC and if, if there's any money left in the Purchase Referred, Precared, Preferred Care Program because it's a finite budget. And every IHS facility, and Dr. Tuhok can relate to this because she spent 30 <laughs> years in the Commission Corps, you have to go back every single year for reauthorization for that funding. It's not, it's not a, a, an entitlement program, so to speak makes it extremely complicated. Well, it makes health care for a Native American very uncertain. And I think along with that too, the other part you have to realize is that the funding that is given to Indian Health Service for Native patients is a third to a half of what is spent on other people, you know, people who get Medicare services or even prisoners in prisons. I mean, so the, the budget that, and the amount of money that's allowed is somewhat tremendously lower to start with. And then as a physician, one of the things that we had to do as part of um, the medical staff was to take all of the cases of people that were referred from the facility that we were working at and prioritize them to see what was usually life-threatening, potentially life-threatening, because we never had funds usually to pay for anything else. So it was a very difficult decision to have to make. Talk about rationing. Yes. You know, really uh, the most extreme example of rationing. So. And you know, Deb, what makes it so offensive is that of all of the citizens of the United States, and Native Americans are citizens mm -hmm. of the United States, we're actually dual citizens. We're citizens of the United States, but we're also citizens of our native nation, whatever that nation may be. For us, incidentally, we're all mm -hmm. <laughs> citizens of the Cheyenne River Sioux Nation, by the way. Um, but what makes it so offensive is that Native Americans are the only citizens in the United States with a legal right to health care. In fact, our health care is guaranteed by, our, by the treaties that our forefathers signed. Um, and, and so, but even still, even with that legal right to health care, we receive the least funding in comparison to CMS, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, VA, the Bureau of Prisons, the Indian Health Service is funded, like Dr. Hulak just said, at a, at a much lower level. And so it really makes, it make, really makes for an interesting uh, uh, problem that, that we are working on and I think we're making headway with. And I think it's also important to recognize that not only is it per capita very poorly funded compared to other things, but you tend to have a population that has higher needs and so potentially more expensive needs for care and that's an important part of the conversation too. Native American Nursing Education Center, 
our Nanex mission is to provide a nurturing and collaborative environment where intentional mentoring inspires Native American nursing students to thrive and flourish. Join On Call with the Prairie Doc as we learn from its mentors, coordinators, instructors, and students about why the center is so important. Nurses are highly revered in our communities, you know, because we're so um, tied personally to people. Indigenous people want to give back from growing up and whether they grew up on the reservation you know, they're urban or rural, it doesn't matter. They want to give back to their population and they can do that, you know, on the reservation in the IHS facilities. They can do that in, for example, here at our new Oyate Health Center, those different types of things. So giving back is huge. Kind of as nurses, like, I feel like that's part of our payback, you know, is to help our underserved populations, better staff, better have these resources. We were asked to help pilot introducing Lakota culture into the nursing curriculum, some of it each semester. And um, Bev has been invited to teach in those courses. It's been very successful. Our main title is being a mentor, and that's exactly what do we do every day in different ways, does not have to be a formal meeting. It's a multidimensional approach because our students are, you know, from a different culture. We have different values and belief system, and we're all trying to navigate and go through a system that is not created or by Native Americans. Initially in our history was the policies of genocide. That was a horrendous experience, and we see the effects of that and it's termed historical trauma. So we see the results of that today in our health disparities. Most, if not all, of our students come from poverty, and poverty plays a profound role in their success or failure, so they, they could succeed and fail. But at the same time, when students are mentored, they're able to be more successful, and that's what we find. When I feel like, oh, I can't do this because I had a, a really big downfall this past the beginning of the semester, both of my kids got RSV, and I was in the hospital for 10 days. And I was like, oh, I'm so far behind. I can't do this. And I talked to these guys, and they were constantly calling me, texting me, checking on me, letting me know they were there. And that encouraged me to be you know, it's okay, I, if I fell behind, I'm gonna get caught back up. And they were my biggest support. Like, besides my family, like, I wouldn't have been able to ke come back to school after that downfall, but I am here. It makes me feel very at home, very appreciative, very comfortable. They definitely are not going to let you give up. They're there to tell you, you can do this. No matter how intimidating or scary it may sound or seem, that it's possible because there needs to be more of us. And just nurses in general, if you're indigenous or not, just nurses in general are really important for everybody. And having our native nurses caring for our native patients and not only that, being present in, in like our veterans hospitals, in our um, private hospitals, like Monument Hospital here, um, we're not invisible. Take the first step and no Nanak is there to support 100% and indigenous nurses are very much needed. And nursing is one of the, is the highest population usually that um, America trusts, but then when you have the indigenous population being able to trust an indigenous nurse, that's, that's a win-win. such a wonderful program. I mean, what a, what a great opportunity. Um, Dr. Erno, why is it important? Why should we worry about increasing representation for Native Americans or um, any underrepresented population? Why can't everybody just come see a white woman like me? 
Although, <laughs> I'm sure you do great with your patients. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I have found that just, you know, even going through medical school, having that intention, being where I am, um, not only have I had the opportunity to explain different views to, for example, like my coworkers and provide a different level of understanding, but um, with some patients, it's been easier to not only get to know them, but kind of find the root of whatever is going on with them. Um, sometimes they can feel more comfortable, but also it's been very like, encouraging to um, you know, other young Native people where maybe they haven't seen a Native doctor before. There have been a few of them that have come in to see me in clinic and been like, wow, I've never met a Native doctor. And I'm like, oh, that's a lot of pressure, but that's great. <laughs> um, you know, and so whether, you know, you're going to be a physician or a nurse, you know, you can really help be an advocate for patients that maybe previously might not have told somebody something or, you know, might have a different like cultural or spiritual need that isn't being met or isn't being answered. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons. Um, but also I think we have a different level of understanding of um, what it need, means to be a, a native person in this area. And that's something that we can, you know, share with patients and, you know, our coworkers as well. So it's, uh, it's great. Anything to add, Dr. Sophie? Um, no, I, I agree. I mean, it, it's definitely helpful to have somebody who you can identify with um, for any of us when we go to see you know, a physician or any, any other healthcare field as well. But um, when I went to medical school, I was actually the first American Indian to graduate from the University of South Dakota School of Medicine. And I found things that were taught to us as physicians on how to interview patients or how to look at healthcare that were different and nobody seemed to understand that perhaps you know other cultures might see things differently you know when our pop native American population is about 10 percent of the state you know i think it's helpful because we do see a lot of natives coming to sioux falls especially for tertiary care um, it is helpful to understand some of the cultural differences um, you know, when we look at um, talking to patients, for example, you know, we're taught in medical school to look people in the eye, whereas culturally that can be somewhat disrespectful. So sometimes, you know, even just the little things can make people feel uncomfortable. And so if we can teach those things to our providers, then we can actually improve our rapport. And anytime you improve that rapport, then you can help improve their health care. So I think that's you know, a great thing and great things to encourage more people in different cultures to be able to go into healthcare fields. And I think it's also important to point out that um, and we say Native American, but that's not a monolithic population either. There are great differences between people who are members of different tribes right. and the cultures that they have. Mm -hmm. So, and, and representation matters. You know, you, you can't imagine, easily imagine, being someone if you don't see someone who looks like you doing that. So that's an important thing and that shared experience. You know, even even for me when I talk to um, parents who may have a child who's going through something, a special needs child, it helps with that rapport when they know, oh, you've got a special needs child too. You know what it's like to do this. And uh, that's one experience and not an integral part of my identity the way your culture is an integral part of your identity. So I think it's an important thing. It's a great program to know we've got in South Dakota. So before we went to the roll-in, we were talking a little bit about funding and how Native American um, individuals have more intense health care needs um, than the average individual in the population. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Dr. Arna? So, um, you know, I, I don't have the exact statistics, but I do know um, that Native American people tend to have higher rates of medical problems, even things like tuberculosis, which we're not used to seeing unless it's from like a refugee population, um, you know, diabetes, uh, complications from that diabetes. Um, there's a lot of medical conditions that I feel like um, maybe go untreated, maybe similar to what my mother was talking about, oh, I have these acute needs and those are more important right now, which can apply to anyone. But there's also, you know, a greater level of like 
mistrust that Native people tend to have of the healthcare system in general for, um, you know, multiple reasons. Um, multiple I, very earned <laughs> reasons. Right. No, um, definitely. I mean, almost everyone I know knows someone that had a very bad experience with a medical provider of some sort, um, which, you know, was part of the reason I went to medical school for sure. Um, and coming to a healthcare provider that you don't know, don't trust, for something that's scary um, would be very hard and a barrier in and of itself. Um, I mean, do you have specific? Uh, well, I, I think part of the, the healthcare needs and, and the disparities that we see, part of it's related to economics. Um, part of it's just related to genetics as well. I mean, we actually find that in our population, we have a higher rate of diabetes um, compared to a lot of other people. Part of it may be diet and environment. You know, if people go back and follow traditional diets, they tend to have less problems with their blood sugars. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have seen a lot more infectious diseases in part partly because we have more um, extended families living together out of necessity because the housing there's just not enough housing there's not a, enough places for people to live um, and again we you know weren't exposed to some of the things that Europeans brought over to this country when they came here and so that some of those things you know be, have become proud of the problem and we actually had uh, large number of our natives die as a result of some of those infectious disease types of problems. Uh, we used as warfare sometimes. It has been. Yeah. Yes, it has. Yeah. Uh, we also have had um, problems with uh, higher rates of things like alcohol-related liver disease uh, because we tend to metabolize things genetically differently. We see higher rates of gallbladder disease, gallstones, and the issues, again, because we must metabolize the cholesterol a little differently, so we have more problems, and we see that more diseases and complications related to that. We also, um, again, partly it's because of the rural areas that we live in, we see a huge number of accidents and motor vehicle deaths uh, related to accidents than we would say in the more populous areas. A lot of barriers, a lot of issues that people face. Tribal leaders in Avera Health are working together to bring health care projects to reservations throughout South Dakota. Prairie Doc reporter Sam Schauer has more on the important work. J.R. LaPlante is the Tribal Relations Coordinator for Avera Health and works on the American Indian Health Initiative. Which is an initiative that started um, about 2014 after numerous requests from our uh, tribal sovereign nations uh, to assist with uh, health care needs and um, health care uh, uh, priorities. Many of those health care needs were not available in a timely manner due to clinic locations, which led to many patients being referred to more urban areas. Because sometimes, depending on the availability of those services, patients can travel as far as Denver, Colorado, uh, to receive those, th that specialty care. The American Indian Health Initiative was soon created, and LaPlante says Avera has received many calls from tribal leaders for specialty care, specifically dialysis care. One project that we're particularly proud of and happy to be a part of is the New Horizon Dialysis Clinic on the Yankton Sioux Reservation. Another program the initiative has helped with is the Pine Ridge Children's Telehealth Network Project, renamed the Lakota Awashte Program. It was through a grant with HRSA, and we worked with the Ogallala Sioux Tribe. We helped them, helped write a grant, and we were funded to create a proof of concept school-based telehealth project specifically for behavior health in five Pine Ridge Reservation schools. And I'm happy to say that after the five years of that grant, we were able to create a proof of concept. The initiative is also paired with the Center of American Indian Research and Native Studies, or CAIRNS. The nonprofit has helped recognize many Native American contributions to South Dakota. Through CAIRNS, we've been able to celebrate uh, Native Americans Day, which is the second Tuesday of October of every year. And LaPlante sees the American Indian Health Initiative growing much more soon. The tribes want to heal. The tribes are the original healers in our state, and they want to heal. And health care has become a top priority for the tribes. And um, we believe that we can be a, a private sector partner uh, to help tribes achieve that goal. So 
for our viewers here, um, it, you're not imagining things. We've actually uh, got a new face at the table here. Uh, Dr. Carol Whitman is a psychiatry resident down in Sioux Falls, uh, and she's joining us now in the studio. So welcome, Dr. Whitman. Hi. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Your sister kind of spilled a little of the beans here, but uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me. I definitely appreciate it. So I am a third-year psychiatry resident in Sioux Falls. Um, like you said, um, I'm Arna's sister, also my mom's daughter. Um, so kind of nice to have two of us here today. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree at University of North Dakota. They actually have an in-med, uh, it's called Indians into Medicine program. So when I was younger, I actually started going to that in the seventh grade, so 10 years every summer until I graduated from um, high school. And then through undergrad degree, I went up there, and then I actually used that track to get into University of South Dakota's uh, medical school. So I've been a part of the in-med program since I was 10. Um, what a wonderful, I didn't even know that program existed until mm -hmm. just now, and that is absolutely incredible. To, again, we were talking about increasing representation. What a wonderful way to do that. Yeah, I was watching you Proof guys that it had, works. Uh, played the thing about the nursing yeah. school, so that yeah. reminded me of that. That's a very, very similar approach. Yeah, fabulous. Um, one of the other things we were talking about just before this last roll-in was about um, why there may be a lot of mistrust uh, for um, underrepresented populations in general, but uh, certainly the Native population in particular. Mr. LaPlante, do you want to talk a little bit about some of those historical factors that have um, lasting repercussions for why people are not willing to trust Western medicine and outside outside providers? Yeah, I think it's well founded that there is a lack of trust between American Indian tribes and uh, the non-American uh, Indian community. Uh, a lot of that is because of um, broken promises, broken treaties, unkept promises, um, abuses um, of human subjects in research, um, uh, just a, a, a whole plethora of, of different uh, historical um, uh, distrust. And so at Avera Health with our American Indian Health Initiative, one of the things that we uh, really focus on is uh, trying to establish trust with our tribal partners, um, seeing them on, on equal footing. Um, but more importantly, I think the main cause of distrust between Indian people and non-Indian people is there's an assumption by the non-Indian world what Indian people need. Mm -hmm. and, and our approach is we want to respond to the priorities that the tribe set. What are their tribal health priorities? What are their tribal health needs as they define them? And then we respond uh, by trying to match our resources in some way to help meet that need. What a novel idea. Let's ask people what they need and <laughs> exactly. how we can help them achieve it. Yes. Yeah. Exactly, and, and I've said it for years, you know, the healthcare needs and priorities on most of our Indian reservations in the United States are decided by a small group of people in Rockville, Maryland, who most of whom have never even visited an Indian reservation. And so um, I learned this when, during my days in state government from my, my good friend and boss, Dennis Dugard, that it's the local community that understands the local needs better than anybody else. And to the extent that we can empower that local community, to take those healthcare services and leverage whatever resources they have to improve upon those services, the better off that community is going to be and the healthier that community is going to be. And it just so happens that we can do that today. Well, we could do that. We could do that since 1975. And tribes are empowered by the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act of 1975, otherwise called Public Law 638. And through Public Law 638, tribes are able to empower themselves by taking over federal health care services that have previously had primacy in the federal government. A lot of potential policy things. You can tell you're really passionate, and that's yes. wonderful. We need people with passion to address some of these issues. Um, some of the problems that local tribes may encounter, you were telling us, uh, Dr. Sophie, a little bit before, uh, and this certainly, for Dr. Carroll, fits into your profession as well. 
depression rates, alcohol rates, suicide rates. Tell us a little bit about some of those issues that may be faced on, on the reservation. Go ahead. So, I mean, we certainly see high rates of all of those, you know, and part of the <clears throat> problems that lead to some of these issues um, have to do with some of the historical traumas and some of the historical things that have happened. You know, a lot of my grandparents and my parents' ages, they were taken from their homes, sent to boarding schools. I mean, they were beaten if they tried to speak their language, punished for, um, you know, trying to do anything that might be a cultural practice. Um, you know, American Indians, we view health as kind of a holistic approach. You know, our health is basically not only our body, but it also involves our mind and our spirit. And so we need to kind of make sure that all of those are in a balance in order for us to be healthy. You know, it, it's really hard for some of the issues that we face because we weren't allowed even to practice our own religion in this country until 1978. Uh, we weren't made citizens of this country until 1924. Um, so you know, some of those things ha have played a long role in causing some historical trauma, which has filtered through the generations. Um, and then of course we face a lot of issues with based on how rural and isolated our communities are, you know, the economic factors, the lack of jobs, the lack of resources, the lack of housing, um, and those all play a role in how you can approach and take care of your health. Dr. Carroll, um, tell us a little bit about mental health rates of, of uh, mental health diseases and conditions in the Native population? Well, studies have really shown that suicide rates in the Native American population are about two times higher, um, especially for some of those younger age groups, which is quite startling, right? Um, but like my mom said, when basic needs aren't being met, I mean, it's quite difficult to focus on your mental health. You know, mental health treatment has definitely come a long way um, over the past years. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of providers out there on the reservation who are able to provide that to the Native Americans, to the population who probably need it a lot, right? It's um, a, a shortage area in general. Absolutely. And then when you add all those other layers in, it's a very difficult situation. Absolutely. But again, going back to the trust component, right, it's quite difficult for someone to come in and say, oh, you have this, this medicine is going to fix it. Well, I don't really know you, and I don't really trust your medicine. You know, we haven't had a lot of good success or what have you, good experience in the past. I think, again, going back to the point of finding more culturally competent physicians, yes, it'd be great if we could have more Native American physicians who could provide that care, um, but culturally competent also. Um, but just to kind of build that trust and kind of show them that you know, this is what we do, this, is, can, this can help to kind of be advocates for them and provide care that's greatly needed. Absolutely. Um, we have a few questions that uh, a lot of them we've kind of answered in the course of this conversation, I think, but uh, this is one that um, I hadn't occurred to. How about hearing problems? Do you see a difference in the percentage of individuals with hearing loss in the native population, Dr. Tuhok? Um, so we actually have seen a higher rates of otitis media in children, uh, which can lead to hearing impairments. Um, part of it, it may be a uh, genetic difference in how um, during the formation of our ear canals is that the, the canals instead of being a little bit more angled so the fluid can drain out, they're a little more horizontal and so fluid will stay longer which then leads to more fluid staying around, more infections and then because of recurring hearing infections then they can't hear as well which can spill over into you know, permanent damage as an adult. Interesting, that's something I didn't know. I've learned a lot here tonight. Um, so one of the questions that someone has, has sent in for us, um, what, what can we do specifically in South Dakota? And I'll broaden that a little bit to our, uh, our immediate area, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Nebraska, Montana. What can we do to increase and improve health care? Uh, for the Native American population and improve representation of Native American um, tribal members going into health care? It's a big question, I know. 
Well, I think some of the things that we're already doing, Deb, we're kind of um, off to a good start. Um, trying to build a Native American workforce, I think, is very important. The number one problem we have in our Native American communities is is having a workforce to provide quality health care services in our, in our tribal communities. Um, where do you start? You start with the youngest population in South Dakota, which is our Native communities. Fifty percent of our tribal communities are under the age of 25, and so there's a vital workforce right there in our backyard. And I think South Dakota State University is doing a fantastic job with its Wokini scholarship to uh, that are, they have award to Native American undergraduate health science students, and and uh, and I think that's a that's a good step in the right direction. Fabulous. So this time has gone so very fast. We've only got a couple of minutes left. So I'd, I'd like to ask for last thoughts, take home messages. Dr. Sophie, Dr. Tuhawk, what, what take home message do you want our viewers to leave with? Well, I, I think that one of the things that we've been talking about is, is there are definitely some disparities in healthcare. Uh, there are definitely a lot of issues that our native populations face within the needs that we have, um, but that by increasing the number of people who are culturally more competent, getting more native folks involved in healthcare on their own reservations are ways that we can improve things. Uh, anything we can do to improve funding, such as the, the Medicaid expansion, and things like that can certainly help as well. Dr. Whitman. Um, I do agree with that. Also want to add on to, um, you know, things such as this, just kind of having open conversations, kind of leaving the door open. I think a lot of, like you said, is just the assumptions, a lot of just the questions is just we don't ask, so how do we know how to help if we don't ask, right? I think that um, our viewers just kind of listening in and kind of hearing about the topic is great, but just take home message for me would be, if you don't know the answer to something, don't be afraid to ask. If it makes you uncomfortable and you feel like you need to ask someone else, do that. Mr. LaPlante. Thanks, Deb. Well, I would say what you've heard tonight, you can on here. And what you've heard tonight is that we have third world condition, healthcare conditions right here in our own backyard in South Dakota. And we all can contribute something to help address it and to help uh, um, address those needs. And I, I agree, I'm very excited about the Medicaid expansion. I think that's gonna be a big help. But I also think we need to advocate and lobby for adequate funding mm -hmm. for the Indian Health Services. That's a huge thing that we have not um, held our elected officials accountable for that historical promise. And I would challenge people, if you've never been to a reservation, you really should go. I mean, see what it's like out there. That's a fabulous take home message. See what it's like. <laughs> The winner of our prize tonight is Bob from South Dakota. Thank you, Bob, for calling in during the first 20 minutes of the show. A gift will be sent to you. Thank you, everybody. We'll be right back after this. Listen today to the Prairie Doc Podcast, a weekly show hosted by Laura Ellsworth, as she talks with medical professionals, takes questions, and walks us through important health topics affecting those in our communities. Search for Prairie Doc on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and wherever you find your favorite podcast today. American Indians face some unique challenges when it comes to caring for their health. Culturally, we view healthcare in a holistic manner as a balance of our bodies, minds, and spirit that allows for good health. Historically, the women would have knowledge of herbs and men would be spiritual healers. Healthcare was one of the items guaranteed under the treaties. Initially, healthcare was overseen by the Army and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Then, Indian Health Service was formed in 1955 to oversee healthcare. Funding for Indian Health Service varies from one year to the next and only provides part of what is needed. Therefore, patients need to enroll in programs such as Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance, which allowed the facilities to be able to fully function. Separate limited funding is given to pay for purchase referred care, in other words, those services that cannot be provided at an Indian Health Service hospital or clinic. The referrals are only covered if you meet certain criteria, such as living within the reservation boundaries. If you live in three other cities in South Dakota, then there are urban Indian health clinics, which are able to provide some limited health care. American Indians face unique challenges to attaining health care as well. There are language, knowledge, and trust issues that impact seeking out health care. 
There is an inherent mistrust by American Indians of Indian Health Service and other government agencies due to many historical abuses and mistreatment over the years. This in turn has led to decline in overall individual well-being. We were not made citizens of this country until 1924. We were not legally allowed to practice our native religion until 1978. Many were taken from their families at a young age and forced to go to boarding schools. They faced many abuses during their time in these schools. In addition, there were other issues such as forced sterilization and studies done without consent or knowledge in the past. These historical traumas continue to affect current generations. There are current economic issues such as lack of employment, housing, and transportation which negatively impact health. We see differences in types of diseases, age of onset of diseases, and ways that treatments need to be given as well. We see higher rates of conditions and deaths due to conditions such as diabetes, liver disease, infectious disease, injuries, and suicides. Some of these rates are higher than any other racial or ethnic group in the United States. American Indian healthcare can be improved by increasing funding, increasing the number of tribal members who become healthcare providers, and improving the education of those who provide healthcare. Thank you to our guests, Mr. LaPlante and the doctors Tuhok, Mora, and Whitman for volunteering their time to help us learn more about healthcare in underrepresented populations. If you would like to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Look for Prairie Doc Perspectives in your local newspaper and online and be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, thank you for joining us for another episode of health information based on science, built on trust. Till next time, stay healthy out there, people. is the largest organ in the body and dermatology seeks to ensure that everything literally skin deep continues to function properly. Dermatology 101, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Based on science, built on trust, join us in supporting the Prairie Docs as we enter our 21st season. Hello, my name is Dave Heink and I serve on the volunteer board of the Healing Words Foundation. 501c3 charity that secures funding for Prairie Doc programming. This past year we celebrated 20 seasons of truthful, tested, and timely medical information from our four Prairie Docs, each of whom volunteers their time to answer important health questions. Thank you to our viewers who continue to help make this programming possible. You are making a difference for public health information in our state. Your donation allows us to continue to deliver on Rick and Joni Holmes' mission, set out over two decades ago. As a friend, supporter, and volunteer for this organization, I believe in its mission, and I know the vital impact it makes in our communities. Please continue to follow us on social media, on South Dakota Public Broadcasting, and YouTube. If you're so inclined, you may make a donation online at prairiedoc.org. Prefer not to donate online? Reach out to us via email and our staff will send you a pledge form. Thanks again for supporting our mission and Prairie Doc programming. Medical information based on science, built on trust. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by at Avera, our nationally recognized health system will be right here with you, with care and coverage. Hello Possibility, Hello Healthy. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System. Ophthalmology Limited. South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians. Avera Heart Hospital. First Bank and Trust. 
Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Monument Health, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Pier District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Orthopedic Institute, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. 